Hello class, hope you're all doing well. Today we're going to talk about credible research and how we can find sources that we can use in our argumentative essays that will pass the credibility test. So <clears throat> the sources that you have available on the internet are hit and miss. Some internet sources are legitimate, perfectly fine to use. Uh, others are questionable. The problem with the internet is that even though it puts a lot of information in the palm of your hand, it also puts a lot of disinformation in the palm of your hand. And some sources, which may look promising, can actually be uh, false or can have problems with their credibility. So we have to be really, really careful when we're looking for sources on the internet. A lot of the time students will go and find sources like certain nonprofit websites and things like that. And they have all these statistics and these neat graphics and things like that. And that can be very um, tricky for some students. They can look at that and go, oh, wow, this looks legit. But in actuality, not so much, right? Um, images can be deceiving. And so there are certain things we can do, namely using Galileo as a way to find our credible sources that can rule out some of the problems. So I want to go ahead and show you, I'm going to share my screen with you here. Uh, and I'm going to show you this right here, okay? And I'm doing this to prove a point. Um, this is a website that in terms of its composition and its graphics and all of that stuff, it looks pretty legit. Um, but these people, maybe you've heard of the Flat Earth Society before, but these people believe that the Earth is flat. Now, the notion that the Earth has flat has been out of favor with humanity for a long time. The ancient Greeks calculated the circumference of the world of the Earth, and um, there's also been all sorts of other mathematical calculations and things that verify that the Earth is in fact a sphere. We've also been to outer space and looked down on it and seen that it was a sphere. Uh, but nevertheless, there is a group of people who believe that all of that is some sort of elaborate hoax, that all of the people at NASA, all of the people involved in astrophysics and uh, study of space, those people are lying to you. They are lying to you willingly, and they are doing so with malicious intent in order to deceive you into believing a false model of the world and thus being unable to understand anything. Uh, as crazy as that sounds, this is not a hoax. I first, when I first heard this stuff, the first time I ever heard about the Flat Earth Society, uh, it was a tweet made by Shaquille O'Neal years ago. And uh, Shaquille O'Neal tweeted about the Flat Earth, and apparently he just did it to be a troll, and he got a big, he got a big rise out of people. And then when they started saying, Shaq, you, do you really think the Earth is flat? He's like, no, do I look ridiculous? Of course, of course it's not flat. I was joking. Uh, so I thought it was a joke, but then I realized that there was, in fact, this subgroup of people that really did believe that the Earth was flat, and they are on a crusade, even, to uh, sort of dispose of the lie of the spherical Earth. Now, it is a crazy notion simply because if that many people are lying to you, like at what point of the internship at NASA does the Illuminati ritual begin and does the initiation happen and then you're in on the joke and you know that the goal of NASA is actually to lie to everyone. It's just, it's crazy. It's the kind of stuff you would expect from someone who has problems with paranoia and things like that. Um, so this is, I use this website because you can look at the graphics here. It's really legit. They've got a forum, a wiki, a library, and of course a store, uh, but zero profit markup. So you know this isn't a gimmick. Uh, and one thing I want to show you here is this, this uh, tribute down here to Mad Mike Hughes. Now, it's hard for me not to, like, be lighthearted about this, but this guy died, okay? He died building a homemade rocket in his garage, uh, which he intended to use to shoot himself into the stratosphere in order to demonstrate that the Earth was, in fact, flat. He's no longer with us, um, and which is not good, but it is, I think, a little bit ironic. Um, and I think there's a certain lesson to be learned here about the dangers of these types of thinking, uh, this type of thinking. Um, if you believe that everything is a grand conspiracy, then you become hell-bent and determined to prove to everyone that it is so, uh, such to the point that you can even sacrifice your life in a very unfortunate way. Uh, and so this is uh, kind of, you know, on one hand, it's a little bit funny, but on another hand, it's not, because 
the fact is, if you can control the flow of information, you can <clears throat> shape the beliefs of anyone. And this is just a fact. So how do we make sure that we don't give over our reason to people who will use uh, their influence over us to convince us of something that isn't true? Well, we have to go for the standards of credibility. And we talked in the crap credibility test lecture about what credibility means and how do we establish it. But we didn't really talk about the um, Galileo option. Uh, that we have that helps us pre-screen for credibility. So moving away from the flat earth, thankfully, I'm going to go here to the course list. Your homepage should look something like this. I don't really know what the student view, if it's different than this one or not. But if you look over here, it says faculty tools. I think it, it will say something similar for you too. Uh, but there's a little thing here that says access Galileo. And if you click on that, it's going to open the Galileo Web page. Now, the, the secret to the, doing the research is to pick a broad topic. So let's say that you wanted to write about um, the health of marine ecosystems. Okay. So then it becomes a, a matter of using the appropriate search, search terms. So um, before you do your Galileo search, though, you have the um, option of doing the advanced search. And the advanced search is really great because it helps you screen out a lot of the crap. The thing about Galileo is, is that even though it has a lot of really useful resources, it is the Georgia Library Online for grades K through college uh, and, and on. So what that means is there's a lot of stuff on here that's like for little kids and for different levels of education. And so what you, what you want to do is you kind of want to narrow that stuff down uh, so that you can better target your sources. Now here you can you can filter by discipline. So they have like agriculture and agribusiness, anatomy and physiology, anthropology, applied sciences, architecture, arts and entertainment. They have all of the dis disciplines. So when you click on whatever discipline that you are looking for, um, then it will narrow down. Now we're doing biology uh, and let's see, what else? Um, environmental sciences yeah so let's just let's try those okay and then let's see the other things that we have uh you can do a full text so sometimes galileo will just show you that the source exists and then if you go and try to find the source yourself you'll notice that there's something called a paywall uh the way that these scholarly journals work is that they run their publication uh, and they're usually like in hard copy form. So if you subscribe to the journal, you get it mailed to you. And then once it's run its course for a year or two, then the journal is released to a database such as Galileo so that you can access it. Um, and so there are full PDFs that are released to Galileo that you can access. But then there are also a lot of just like um, citations of sources that exist but that Galileo may not have access to the full text for it. It can be very frustrating to run a Galileo search and then find, oh, this is a perfect source, but lo and behold, it doesn't have a full text and I have to pay $15.99 to read it. I don't want you to pay anything, so please don't. Um, but you can click on full text and you can click on scholarly peer reviewed journals because that's what we're really looking for. This is like the creme de la creme of sources for academic writing. Scholarly means that somebody with a degree wrote it. Peer reviewed means that people from the field that that person is in also read it and generally agreed with its principles. And then a journal, of course, is a publication. They're periodically published. Um, and so by making these two selections of full text and scholarly peer reviewed journals, you will get a uh, lot of the headache out of the way. So we've got our discipline selected. We've got uh, full text scholarly peer review. So let's see what we got. That's not right at all. What happened? Uh, what happened? Sorry about that. Okay, uh, so here's what we have. We have evolutionary model of coal mine safety system based on multi-agent modeling. That's nothing related to what we're doing. Industrial reheating furnaces. Uh, Win-win, let's see, nutrient removal. Okay, so it looks like our search terms, we didn't really put in very good search terms. This is just everything that's related to environmental stuff. So let's try, uh, let's try marine ecology, meaning 
the ecological health of the oceans. Let's see, tracking penguins. Uh, what evidence exists on how changes in marine ecosystem structure and functioning ecosystem delivery? See, that's one that's jargon. I don't understand that. Do you? Uh, the effects of sea turtle and other marine megafauna consumption in northeastern east, north Madagascar. Okay, that's a little bit niche, right? Unless you're writing about northeastern Madagascar, you might have a hard time. Modeling polar marine ecosystem functions guided by bacterial physiological and taxonomy. Interesting, but again, maybe a little bit over our heads. Natural experiments and long-term monitoring are critical to understand and predict marine host microbe ecology, research biases, uh, trends in phytoplankton communities. So we got lots of stuff, but it looks like our search terms a little broad. So instead of marine ecology, tell you what, let's do Let's narrow our search. Let's say, well, I want to do something on ocean health, but it looks like that these searches are, uh, it just looks like it's not really working out. So what I'm going to do is um, let's type in kelp forests, because I had a student write an essay called Help the Kelp one time, which was a clever title, uh, and it was about how important the uh, kelp forests were so and how we should save them because they were threatened. So here we have Let's see, harnessing synthetic biology for kelp. So this is how to, how to conserve kelp forests. That might be helpful. Scale-specific drivers of kelp forest communities. A year in the life of Central for California kelp forest. Physical and biological insights into biogeochemical variability. See, that part I don't know. Uh, changes in kelp forest biomass. Status trends and drivers of kelp forest in Europe. Patterns and drivers of, uh, let's see, biological interactions. No. Can giant kelp forests enhance vertebra vertebra invertebrate recruitment? Whatever that is. Uh, okay. So it looks like we're having a hard time finding stuff on conservation. See, and this is the problem with research. Like, I'm not trying to frustrate you guys, but this is the issue is that when you're trying to find, so let's, let's go up and refine it even further, because that's what it's about. It's about refining search terms, coming up with a list of terms, refining those terms. Uh, so let's, let's try kelp forest preservation and see what we get. Uh, the impact of kelp forest on organic matter content and sediment, harnessing synthetic biology for kelp forest. We already saw that one. Uh, importance of, see, this is tough. Linking environment, kelp forest habitat dynamics and okay, the empty forest, let's see. Seaweed production, effects of macroalgal structure, no. Yeah, this is tough, okay, so we're having a hard time. Uh, all right, well, let's try, how about we try uh, marine protected areas? Let's say, all right, well, I know I wanna do something about the ocean, the kelp forest thing didn't hit, so let's try marine protected areas and see what we find. Ah, okay, so what is a marine protected area? A marine protected era, area is uh, a possible solution to overfishing. So in places where there are too, uh, too much fishing going on, you can s like set off a certain section of ocean that is a marine protected area. And usually it's like places where fish will breed and things like that. Um, and so these marine protect protected areas, if you make them and no one's allowed to fish there, then the fish populations actually can make a huge comeback in a relatively short period of time. So a marine protected area might be, if you go back to the problem, solution, so what thesis structure, a marine protected area might be a way to address the problem, a solution to address the problem of overfishing. If the problem is overfishing, the solution is the creation of marine protected areas. But in order to make that argument, we need to know for sure whether or not marine protected areas actually do the job. So that's where the research comes in. We look here, here's some stuff on marine protected networks in Indonesia. Uh, telling us about how how that's gone in Indonesia. Um, here is one, a progress and legal framework in, issues in the establishment control of Indonesian marine protected areas. So again, Indonesia, but it doesn't really matter because it can tell you about maybe the problems that you might hit when you're trying to create these areas. And once you create the areas, how do you enforce it? Multiple drivers of invasive line fish culling efficiency and marine, oh, okay, so maybe there's a problem. If you make a marine protected area and the lion fish comes in, how do you get rid of the lionfish? So maybe there are problems that you didn't anticipate. This source might be interesting. Analysis of fish population size distributions confirm cessation of fishing in marine protected areas. Okay, so it means that MPAs are being enforced. Weaknesses and strengths in marine protected areas in Rio de Janeiro. 
Cool. So we could, all of these now, this you see, now we're on to something. Now we've got a thread, right? Because marine protected areas are a way that we can combat the problem of overfishing. I knew I wanted to do ocean ecology. I, I didn't necessarily know what. I used a couple of different search terms, a couple of different topics. I let the research be my guide. But now I'm finding stuff and I'm saying, okay, we've got some stuff here on MPAs. It's going to be pretty good uh, make, to write an essay on this. So let's click on, you click on the source, okay? And this is all the citation information in the abstract. You can read the abstract to avoid reading the entire uh, as, um the entire text if you want. But then here's the PDF, full source. Let's take a look at it. Okay, we've got an abstract. Lots of information here about the status of MPAs and how they were developed and got tables and graphs and all sorts of juicy stuff, scholarly peer reviewed. This might be a winner. Um, and there are lots of sources like this. Now, you've got to make sure that you can understand the source. And, there, and a source that's really academic and really scholarly, a lot of times there's some jargon and stuff, and that can be kind of hard. But if you can find a way to use the source, um, then you should do it because those are good, uh, good sources to have. So we have lots of stuff evaluating seabed habitat uh, representativeness across a diverse set of MPAs. Okay, good. So like how much is the seabed recovering? Lots of stuff on MPAs. So um, this would be a good way to find the research and you use Galileo, you use the advanced search to do it. We swung, we missed a couple of times and then we got a thread and now it's just a matter of, of taking your time, examining these sources, figuring out which ones are good to use, which ones maybe not so much, and then using them as evidence through the exemplification strategy as evidence for the claims that you put forth in the topic sentences. MPAs can help us combat overfishing. So then you go and you find the stats to back it up. And those stats are buried somewhere in these articles, right? Now you do have to read them and you do have to pilfer through it. And it can get frustrating because there are limitations. Um, now you may say, well, I can't find anything on Galileo. Can I use Google Scholar? Google Scholar almost always hits you at a paywall. Well, what about Google generally? Okay, but if you do Google generally, you, use the, you lose the filter for scholarly sources, right? And so you're, you're going to have maybe scholarly sources, but maybe also crap that you can't use. So uh, it's, it is a delicate thing. Let the research be your guide. If you don't know what topic to choose, but you have a ballpark idea, start coming up with some search terms, plugging some stuff in, seeing what kind of research you can find, whether or not you can make heads or tails of it. And then use that research as the evidence to back up the claims that you put forth in your essay. So I think I've talked enough about that. If you have any questions about Galileo and how it works and how to access it and make it all work, you know how to reach me via my email. Uh, other than that, I hope you have an excellent week and I'll see you next time.